Hello, St. Mary Magdalene family, and those of you joining us by internet, uh, welcome to this, our third day of the uh, Holy Week retreat. Today is Holy Tuesday, and we'll be with Jesus today uh, as he teaches in the temple, and you can follow along with uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 13 and 17 is what we're going to focus on today. But as we get started, I'd like us to begin with a prayer and a song. So we're going to sing, um, Open the Eyes of Our Hearts, Lord. It's an oldie but a goodie, and I think it really helps us to, to really open our hearts to what we're going to hear, the, open our hearts and our minds and our souls to the Lord. So let's begin by singing, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for continuing to lead us and guide us on this Holy Week retreat. We pray, Lord, that you send down your Holy Spirit upon us to open the eyes of our hearts, the eyes of our minds, and our souls to hear you, to follow you, to learn from you. We pray, Lord, that throughout this day, that you may be our way maker, our pathfinder, that you may be the light in the darkness for us as we seek to follow you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. So, uh, like I said just a minute ago, we're going to focus on where Jesus is today in Holy Week. Uh, Jesus is in the temple. So if you remember yesterday, Jesus comes into town and he cleanses the temple, throwing people out and things like that. And, um, and he stays there. And this is an interesting thing because throughout his the next couple of days, uh, Jesus stays in the temple. He's there. He's there Monday. He's there Tuesday. He'll be there tomorrow uh, during the daytime. And what Jesus is doing is he's teaching. And many of the scribes, Pharisees, the temple priests, and and and, uh, and folks are looking to trip him up because they're angry about what he did when he cleansed the temple. And now they they they're plotting for his death. And they're trying to find a way to do that. And so what we find out here is an instance in which Jesus is teaching in the temple. And this is a very beautiful teaching for us. Uh, so I'll read a little bit from Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 17. It says, They sent some Pharisees and Herodians to him to ensnare him in his speech. They came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you are not concerned with anyone's opinion. You do not regard a person's status, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or should we not pay? Knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought one to him, and he said to them, Whose image an inscription is this. They replied to him, Caesar's. So Jesus said to them, Repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. They were utterly amazed at him. So this is a passage that we're all very familiar with, I hope, that we've heard many times. But it's also very beautiful teaching, because what we have here is this interesting encounter where the, the Pharisees and, and chief priests and Herodians are trying to trip Jesus up so they have a reason to accuse him. And we know that in a few days they will accuse him. On Thursday night they will arrest him and they will trial, put him on trial overnight, actually, so that no one is around to hear what's going on and they're bringing false charges against him. Well, this is one of those moments where they're trying to catch him early on and have something to accuse him of, but they can't. And there's something beautiful in, in what, is, what is going on. They call Jesus teacher. And that's an important title for us because Jesus is a teacher of our faith and wants to lead us and guide us. And, and we have to be open to what he actually says and how he actually teaches us if we're going to grow in our faith, if we're going to mature as disciples. And that's an important thing. Jesus is our teacher. And they say to him, Jesus, we know you're a teacher. You're a truthful man and not concerned with anyone's opinion. And that's an interesting statement as well, that Jesus, you know, they're, they're praising Jesus for all the good things. And despite all these good things, they still don't trust him. They still can't see past, uh, you know, their false ideas. And and so they, they know that he's truthful. They know he's righteous. And they know he doesn't care about anyone's opinion. And that's interesting for us because we need to be able to be like Jesus, right? And not care about other people's opinions so long as we're doing what God has called us to do and, and be who God has called us to be. And it also says, you do not regard a person's status, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And that's a beautiful thing, accordance with the truth. And we'll talk a little bit more about truth in just a minute. Uh, but the scripture goes on and it says, they, they ask him the question, who should we pay uh, the taxes to, Caesar or not, right? Uh, is it okay? And they're they're looking for a yes no answer. Yes, if you pay the tax to Caesar, then you're a friend of Caesar, and therefore you're not against you're against the God's people. If you say no, don't pay Caesar, then you are therefore against the Romans, and they can bring that against you to the Roman authorities, right? And so they think they've got Jesus trapped here, and Jesus walks the middle ground, and it's very beautiful. He says, "Show me an image." You know of this you know show me a description uh, of a denarius and what's interesting about this is they are inside the temple right so they're inside the temple where he is teaching they're not outside the temple and so inside the temple uh, nothing that is of non-jewish origin is allowed in right so if you have for example a roman denarius roman money in your pocket you should not have that on you 
right? That is defiling you and you are then defiling the temple, right? So you should not have it with you. It should have stayed out, you know, put it in a locker outside, right? So, uh, so when he says, you know, show me a denarius and they produce one, one of these Pharisees or Herodians pulls out a coin and shows it to Jesus. Jesus is already capturing them. He's already said, look, you're actually being hypocrites because you're not supposed to have that with you here and now, but they do. And they don't even notice it. They don't even catch on to this trick in a sense. And he says, well, whose image is that? Which is another way of saying, well, who does that belong to? And well, it belongs to Caesar. And so Jesus very rightly says, repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. And they were amazed at him because they thought they had him fooled. They thought they had this, this trap laid out for him. But God's ways are not our ways. And God sees into the human heart and into the mind. And he knew that in their mind they couldn't understand what was about to happen. And so, and so it's true with us in many ways. That we don't understand that through our mind, that our minds are made by God and, and are filled by God's light and love unless we fill them with darkness, right? And so we belong to God and we should give ourselves to God. Whatever is not of God, in this case, this is Denarius, uh, which doesn't belong to the temple, belongs to Caesar, it has his image on it. It's like, give that back to him. Give back to the world what belongs to the world so that it's not filling up your life. That's one of the things that, that we can take away from this. From recognizing that all that we have, all our possessions, all our time, all our, all our energy, even this time of quarantine, all this belongs to God. Our very lives belong to God. And so one of the things we need to do is to be able to remember to give these back to God in, in gratitude and gratefulness and allow God to then restore and renew us in the ways that we need to be restored and renewed. And so getting to the back to the theme of the way maker, uh, you are a way maker, uh, miracle worker, promise keeper and then the other verse is light in the darkness and it's a beautiful image of light because light in the darkness is an image of intellectual knowledge of wisdom of prudence the way that god shows the path that we should go on is to enlighten our minds right and so it's important to open our minds to the faith it's interesting that elsewhere in scripture jesus is asked what is the greatest commandment right and his response is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And it's interesting because what we have here are four items, heart, mind, soul, and strength. And Jesus is saying that we're supposed to offer all ourselves, our whole selves, to, to, to the Father, right, in return. And that is how we, we grow in faithfulness and, and in right worship of God is through our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And what's interesting about that is that a lot of us, uh, many times we've, we've come to the faith initially through some sort of retreat or experience uh, that moves our heart, right? It moves our heart and we feel God's love, we feel God's presence, and we get on this emotional high uh, for a little while. And... And that, that's good. It's, not, it's a good beginning, in a sense. But what happens when that, that spiritual high, that emotional high, goes away? Well, many people backslide. They, they fall back into their old ways, their old patterns of thinking, of acting, of doing, of believing. And they, they, they fall back into sin and misery and things like that until the next retreat, perhaps. And there's some people that get addicted to retreats and they have to do them over and over and over again because this is their source of of strength. This is their source of, of life. But what God wants us to know, what Jesus is trying to teach us, is that, hey, there's a lot more life out there than just going on retreats and just your heart. And when your heart fails you, or when your emotions fail you, that's when you rely on your mind, your soul, and your strength to carry you forward. And in fact, we need all of them to grow as a whole person in goodness and in holiness. So, there's another part in scripture where Jesus says, actually, he does this a lot when he's teaching. So right now the theme is with the teaching of Jesus today. And he's in the temple teaching. And a lot of Jesus' teachings begin the same way. He says, you have heard it said, but I tell you. You have heard it said, but I tell you, which is his way of saying, this is what you think you know 
uh, because you've heard it a lot. You know, maybe this is popular with a bunch, a lot of people. This is what you hear on the radio or TV, whatever, what you're reading on the news. But I have a different message for you. And, and this is another way of Jesus saying, you know what? You don't know what you don't know. So let me enlighten you, right? Let me drop some knowledge on you. And, and that's such an important thing, the knowledge that God wants to share with us, right? Because emotions will only carry you so far. And what Jesus wants to teach us is beautiful, but we have to be able to accept it. So we look at the heart. The heart is a beautiful thing, but we also have a mind. And this is where we need to be willing to be enlightened, to have uh, the Lord teach us and guide us in those ways. The things that we have heard or the things that we believe in, whether they're, they're culturally uh, popular or not, he has a different message to teach us. And when we come to growing in faith, that's what we have to do. We have to accept those teachings so that we can grow out of our fear, out of our anxiety, grow out of our doubt, and grow into his will for us, his plan for us. Scripture talks about, I will show you the way you should go. Well, we can't do that unless our minds are willing to accept what, what Jesus is teaching. Uh, in in our, our willfulness, our pride, our arrogance at times, our unwillingness to accept church teaching or Jesus' guidance uh, can be linked to the fall. It's one of the effects of the fall, of original sin. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, original sin has the effect of dimming our intellect. It's darkening our mind, right? That's one of the effects. Another one is strengthening of our passions, our desires, right? Uh, and another one is to weaken our will. And, and that's really powerful when you think about it, that, that we are living in a way that we weren't intended to, that God made us to have our minds that lead us and guide us uh, in truth, right, through right understanding of things and our passions that are uh, under that, right, that fuel us and strengthen us in our willpower, the, the power of our soul and our will, our spirit to be able to control uh, what we're doing, right? Like all that's meant to work together. In a, in a good image to use with how this works is that uh, the effect of sin on each of us is like a uh, stagecoach driver. You know, somebody like in the Old West driving a stagecoach and all of a sudden they're in this thick fog. And so their minds cannot see far enough and they're disoriented sort of thing. But that's not enough. That's just the effect of, their, of your mind. You can't see where you're going. You don't understand clearly, right? But the next part is that the horses themselves are strengthened. The horses begin to kind of go crazy, go wild, right? And But that's not, that's not enough. That's not bad enough. The next part is that the reins themselves, which are like the strength of the will, are weakened. Maybe they, they've gone loose and you no longer have complete control over the horses. And so this is an image of what St. Thomas Aquinas is talking about, of the effects of sin on us that our minds are dimmed, our passions are strengthened, and our will power is weakened, right? And so it's like the stagecoach, all of a sudden, you know, I can't see where I'm going, I should be a little more careful, I don't even know where I am, and yet the horses are running wild and I can't even get a hold of the reins, right? So this is an image of who we are and where we are in our lives. And so this is where Jesus enters in and he says things to us like, Learn from me. Take my yoke upon your shoulders and learn from me. And if you're yoked to Jesus, and this is where you can think of two oxen, you know, the yoke ties the two together. And the reason they're tied together is, is so that one can guide the other. And this is what we're looking for. We want Jesus to lead us and guide us, right? And one of those ways is that, that he enlighten our minds and show us uh, how we should grow. So mature discipleship it's all about growing into a greater faith, growing beyond just the emotions of your heart to include your mind, your soul, and your body, okay? Now, a lot of people will say things like, well, I never knew that. You know, I've never heard that before. And, and I do a lot of talks, uh, different parishes, been doing this for over 25 years uh, here in Texas and in, in, in Indiana, Midwest. And... You know, I, I have a Master of Divinity degree. I'm not boasting. I'm just giving a little background for those of you who don't know me. And, and I've been doing ministry for a long, long time. And ministry is all about continuously learning, continuously growing, right? Because you never can learn it all. You never can understand it all. 
in, in their search for truth is a search for God, right? In, in allowing God to enlighten our minds so that we can overcome doubt, overcome despair, in, in trust in his promises and in the truth of, of him acting in our lives. So as I do teachings on different subjects, I'll often hear from other people, oh, I never knew that, I never heard that before. And that's a common thing. I get it. I, I, I'm the same way. But the question I always have is, why not? And this is where I want to go with this. The light in the darkness. That Jesus is our light. God is our way maker. One of those ways is to open our minds to his truth. The question is, why not? And there's two basic answers as to why not. Why haven't you heard this before? Why don't you know more about your faith? And the first basic que uh, response to that question is, uh, you only receive what you hear and see from other people, okay? Which is, in a sense, saying that you passively sit back and you listen to other people or or hear them, right? It's like going to school and sitting in school and, you know, you're kind of listening, maybe not completely listening to whatever the teacher tells you. Well, that's one way to learn, but it's not the best way to learn, right? Uh, and the other way, the other answer is... You actively pursue the truth and knowledge of the faith, right? So the question, which one are you? A lot of Catholics, a lot of people, we're more passive than we are active. If, if you're limiting yourself to what you hear at a homily or what you hear in a talk once a week or less, then it's no wonder that you haven't heard a whole lot because you never will hear a whole lot if you're limiting it to between five and ten minutes uh, once a week. Right, because that's really what the homily is. A homily is a reflection on scriptures, uh, about five to ten minutes, depending on who your preacher is, who your pastor is, uh, once a week. And if you go a little bit more often, you go to uh, different prayer groups and you have different teachings, that grows a little bit more, right? To maybe, maybe let's say an hour a week, right, of different types of teaching. That'd be fabulous. But here's another question to go with that: How much time do you spend watching TV? listening to the radio, uh, or doing other things. And the reason I ask that question is when you begin to actually write down how much time you spend doing these things versus how much time you give to growing in your faith and in growing intellectually and in, in your knowledge and understanding, because that knowledge and understanding leads us ultimately to wisdom and to prudence and to grace-filled living, right? because we're, we're doing what God has asked us to do, and we begin to understand it differently, and it changes us, it transforms us. If you're only sitting back passively, I hate to say this, you're not gonna get very far. We're called to actively pursue the truth and knowledge of our faith, actively follow Jesus. And this is where Jesus calls the disciples, come and follow me, and throughout those three years of them following him, he teaches them personally, directly. And that's what we receive from the Holy Spirit, when we have a life of prayer and a life of study, of study where we're, it doesn't mean necessarily sitting down in a classroom with a book or things like that. The study means to be open to Jesus teaching us and pursuing Jesus. If all you're doing is going to church once a week or less and sitting back and listening maybe to the homily, that's not necessarily actively following. Actively following is every day finding Jesus and asking Jesus, Lord, teach me your ways. Lord, open my mind, open my heart to you. So as we end today and, and go forward, uh, reflecting on this, uh, Jesus as teacher, because that's what he's doing again in the temple today. He's teaching us. He, he's telling people, you have heard it said this, but I tell you this, that, the other, you know, so that you can grow, so you can, will not be burdened by lies. You will walk in freedom in truth. This is where we are. He is the teacher. And we ask the teacher to enlighten our path, open our minds uh, to his truth, open us and relieve us of our pride because many times we can be very stubborn. Like, I don't want to believe that because I don't want to change, right? So here are a few questions I want to leave you with uh, to discuss with a friend or a small group or any way you want to or just to think about yourself and continue journaling throughout this week and thinking about it, uh, the questions are, number one, Jesus says, take my yoke upon your shoulders and learn from me. Do I live my faith actively learning 
or passively waiting? Do I live my faith actively learning, pursuing, following Jesus, or passively waiting? The next question is, do I try to mature in my discipleship beyond the emotional level to include other parts of my life, including my intellect and my will to serve humbly and to be part of an encouraging community? Do I try to accept and understand church doctrine and the teaching of my pastor and spiritual leaders or are there strongholds of fear or pride that I do not want to give up? And this is a difficult one for some, some people, and, and it's important for us to really spend time with that question. Really look at the fullness of our, of our faith in our lives week to week, year to year. What do I accept of church doctrine and, and teaching and practical advice from my pastor and other spiritual leaders? And what do I reject? Because in rejecting them, in a way, I'm also rejecting Christ. So these are the questions uh, I want to leave you with. And uh, as our closing prayer, I want to offer this prayer for you. And I'll include this in the description box uh, below. This is a prayer by St. Augustine, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo. It's called Flood the Path with Light. And again, God is our way maker, our miracle worker, our promise keeper, light in the darkness. And so we're asking God to flood our hearts, flood our minds with his light. So let's uh, pray this prayer uh, from St. Augustine. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of our life, there are days when the burdens we carry chafe our shoulders and weigh us down. When the road seems dreary and endless, the sky is gray and threatening. When our lives have no music in them, and our hearts are lonely, and our souls have lost their courage. Flood the path with light. Turn our eyes to where the skies are full of promise. Tune our hearts to brave music. Give us the sense of comradeship with heroes and saints of every age. And so quicken our spirits that we may be able to encourage the souls of all who journey with us on the road of life to your honor and glory. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then we'll end with a song, and hopefully you'll enjoy this, and we'll uh, see you again tomorrow. God bless. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, oh, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, oh, I believe you are the way, the truth, and the life.